concerned, the absolute truth is the personality of Godhead, Shri Krishna. And this is confirmed in every step. In this verse in particular, it is stressed that the absolute truth then is the person. That the personality of Godhead is the supreme absolute truth. It is also the affirmation of the Brahma Samhita, Ishwara Paramma Krishna Sachyananda Brigaha. That is, the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead is Lord Krishna, who is the primeval Lord, the reservoir of all pressure, Govinda, and the eternal form of the complete bliss and knowledge. These authorities leave no doubt that the absolute truth is the supreme person, the cause of all causes. The impersonalist, however, argues on the st strength of the Vedic version given in the Sweta Swaktara Upanisha. Yeah, Sweta Tatuya Uttaram Tamataram Tam Arupan Anamayan Yat Etabidur Amitra Stev Bhavanti Atetare Dukan Evanfianti. How about that? Spanish text. Those little slashes help you out. Yeah. In the material world, Brahma, the primeval living entity within the universe, it is understood to be the supreme amongst the demigods, human beings, and lower animals. But beyond Brahma, there is a transcendence who has no material form and is free from all material contaminations. Anyone who can know him also becomes transcendental, but those who do not know him suffer the mysteries of the material world. Okay. Hmm. Any, and right now we need a minute to process according to guidelines here. So uh, any, any to take a breath for a second. I'm getting cold. Nice to see Guru Bhakti come on. And Vishaka, Saki, nice to See you. So any 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 thoughts on this? The verse or the purport? The verse isn't it nice? Uh, there's no truth to superior to me. Everything rests upon me as pearls are strung on the thread. Does anybody has anybody ever seen the thread on the pearl? We don't see it, isn't it? We we don't see that thread, and we just see the beauty of the pearls. But we all know that there's a thread behind there, but we never see it. And you know, just I just see the neck, I just see my neck beat. I don't think about the string that's holding them together. And so Krishna is that string that's holding everything together in the whole material world. Everything is held together. As listening, Robert was speaking with um, this Dr. Patel on, on Bombay on Juhu Beach. He, that Dr. Patel, sometimes he cracks up and he just starts laughing and laughing and laughing. Prophet's answers are so quick and so concise and so direct that, that, that he has, there's nothing he can do besides accept. And if he didn't, if he, if he didn't laugh, he would probably cry because it's just so, probably so cutting, so cutting. But this idea that of the, of the, of the, of the not being able to see Krishna behind everything. Um, this is due to the, you know, just like the, the ignorance, oh my jan, I mean, agyan, no knowledge. We don't see that behind it. We don't see Krishna behind everything. So any takeaways? I gave a little opening sentence. We depend on this group for the takeaways. Well, for me, for me as that, that part where it says, in this verse in particular, it is stressed that the absolute truth is a person. And I, that kind of hits close to home as a pujari, my seva, there's something I constantly had to remind myself, Krishna is a person. And even though while we serve in and while we dress in their lordship, I had to remind myself, this is a person. Everything that I do, I had to, really think would I do that to myself mm -hmm. especially like when you put in pins on them would I walk with the sari wearing a bunch of pins on myself oh mm -hmm. I mean just little things I had to keep reminding myself Krishna is a person 
And, and that's one thing that I, I'm always trying to, I like that, that it kind of popped to me because that's something I, I always try to remember. Whatever I do, remember Krishna is a person. It's not a mannequin. <laughs> it's not a doll, you know, treat him mm -hmm. as a person. Just like the holy name is Nama Prabhu. The holy name is a person. Um, if, if, just like, for example, if you give the example, just like, for example, you give the example. Um, just like if, if somebody walks in the room and I don't acknowledge them, it's really rude, isn't it? Say, especially someone that you know. And actually someone that, just imagine you're calling somebody it's like if I were to say, I know I can't pick on anybody here. I don't know. I'll just say, like Sri, not this our Sri Rupa here, but Sri Rupa that just came in and changed the sheets in my bed. If I just said, hey, Sri Rupa, you got to come over and change the sheets. You got to come over and change the sheets. You got to come over and change the sheets. The bed's too heavy for me. I can't. And then and he shows up, and I don't acknowledge him. It's like it's like super. It's like. I just treat him like he's not a person. He's not like a, not, he's not there. It's actually very, very rude. And in the same way, we're here all day long. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. I think this is going to be tomorrow's WhatsApp. If I can remember, I said this today. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare, Hare Rama. And Jen, in just ignoring, just ignoring that that is actually non-different than, than that. It, the holy name is actually non-different than Krishna. Krishna is personally present. Um, the some places it's described that Krishna is actually dancing on our tongue as we chant the holy names of the Lord. And how more, how much more personal can we get than that? And yet we, and yet we, um, we ignore. I mean, it's just like we just, oh, we're not, we're not here. We're not, we're not, we're not real. We don't. We, we just don't acknowledge your presence in, in our chanting. Um, that takes some practice, doesn't it? For me, it takes a lot of practice. For me, it takes a lot, a lot of practice. Good takeaway, Gretchen. For me, anyone else? Yeah, meditation. Uh, Maharaj, I would like to continue the theme of how Rupa establishes Krishna in past um, two. Yeah. yeah. In past two verses, he was talking about like you know the creation, the creator, and the things like that. Mm -hmm. And now finally, Prabhupada says that he is Krishna and he is supreme personality of God. He is a mm -hmm. person. Yeah. So Prabhupada kind of systematically defies all the impersonal concept. Mm -hmm. And like devotee friend. That why Prabhupada mentioned that um, you know Krishna is a person in the first line itself. Yeah, yeah. And he shared a very nice analogy with me. He said in this verse, Krishna says that he is like you know he is invisible in one sense. Mm. And whenever we hear about invisibility, people directly link it to impersonalism. Mm. So Prabhupada this making things very clear that Krishna is a supreme yeah. person. He is not in person. Mm. Nice. Very yeah. cool. Nice. What do we call it? Reflection. What do we call it? Anyway, I'm not going to go into that. Anyone else? Yeah. 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 Any thoughts on this verse or first paragraph of the first part? No pressure. No pressure. Have a volunteer for the second paragraph to read the second paragraph. Okay, since I can do it, this is no volunteers. Just meant to start to feel guilty. <laughs> oh, I can I can read much. Okay, okay. Hey, thank you, Ashmita. <laughs> <laughs> um. Oh, would you like me to skip the verses, the Sanskrit? Whatever, whatever you desire, whatever, whatever you desire. Okay. <laughs> the impersonalist puts more stress on the word arupam, but this arupam is not impersonal. It indicates the transcendental form of eternity, bliss, and knowledge as described in the Brahma Samhita quote, uh, quoted above. 
Other verses in the Svitashvatra Upanishad substantiate this as follows. I know that Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is transcendental to all material conceptions of darkness, only he who knows him can transcend the bonds of birth and death. There is no way for liberation other than this knowledge of that Supreme Person. There is no truth superior to that Supreme Person, because he is the supermost. He is smaller than the smallest, and he is greater than the greatest. He is situated as a silent tree, and he illuminates the transcendental sky. And as a tree spreads its roots, he spreads his extensive energies. From these verses, one concludes that the supreme absolute truth is the supreme personality of Godhead, who is all-pervading by his multi-energies, both material and spiritual. Mm. Nice verse, huh? Anyone have any uh, thoughts or takeaways or reflections on this? I really like the part where, he, where it says he, uh, the second sloka translation, he is situated as a silent tree. This is not, you know, he's, this, he's like the power mountain, he's sitting situated within the heart of every living entity. He's always there. Uh, he illuminates the transcends the sky and he's, he's, and he's the root spreads its, the tree spreads its roots. He spreads his extensive energies. It's amazing, Krishna's everything, isn't it? It's just like, we've given that example so many times that there's nowhere Krishna is not present. It's up to us to learn how to see him. <clears throat> I just heard that example again, Prophet just gave it like two or three days ago of the car breaking down and the mechanic looking. I mean, a regular person looks underneath the hood and can't figure out what's wrong. And then a mechanic comes and looks underneath the hood and he moves a few things or whatever and the car works. So in the same way, you know, um, the difference is that the mechanic's been trained to see, and if we can take the time to train ourselves to actually see Krishna, with, learn to see Krishna and, and practice seeing Krishna within everything, then what a benediction that is. Anyone else have some takeaway? We always see you like this. You're always very thoughtful. Right? <laughs> I was thinking we're going to get something from you. <laughs> Not much, just um, no pressure. No pressure. There's absolutely no pressure. But when I see people like this, it's like it's very encouraging because we know they're thinking, they're listening, or at least it's at least, at least it's a listening pose, right? Yeah. Well, then then the pressure is on. But it was yeah. making me think of the other day I was reading um, the Sri Shapanishad, and in Mantra Eight it speaks about, and this is for some reason this one idea stuck with me. How transcendental means no veins. And then when um, Rajabhumi mm. was speaking about how she's thinking all the time of Krishna when she's dressing Krishna Radharani and thinking about how they're a person. And I'm, it's just, it keeps sticking in my mind that yes, they are, you know, like Krishna can do everything with his arms and legs, right? Like his arms that he can do with his legs. So he's like us, but not like us. So it's just like it, that without veins keeps sticking in my mind to remind me that, you know, Krishna is everything. Yeah. Yeah, the Ishapanasa is a really good book. I mean, it really lets you know that Krishna is a person. Out of, you know, out of all the small books, that one really... I mean, it's a it, because it's your, one of the Upanishads. It's meant it's meant to get to catch the impersonals. Upanishads, isn't it? The Upanishads are definitely there, especially Isha Upanishad. Yeah, thank you. That's very good. No, very good. That, your thoughtfulness, your thoughtfulness came through. Anyone else? Okay, we're going to go to the next verse. This is a famous one. That, the last one was a famous one. This one also famous. 
Vahoham ap sukunteya prabhasmi sati suyaha yo anava sarvavedeshu sadhake sadhake ka persham nishu. I do that word. Maybe I only know in the first two lines. O Senakunti, I am the taste of water. I am the light of the sun and moon. I am the syllable om in Vedic mantras. And the sound in ether and the ability in man. Every one of us is hearing here now because there's ether in the air. That ability for us to hear, if we're hearing, we should be thinking of Krishna. Isn't that nice? I have a volunteer for the purport. Thank you, Raymond. Okay, thank you. This verse explains how the Lord is all pervasive by his diverse material and spiritual energies. The Supreme Lord can be preliminary perceived, preliminarily perceived by his different energies, and in this way he is realized impersonally. As the demigods in the sun is a person and is perceived by his all-pervading energy, the sunshine, so the Lord, although in his eternal abode, is perceived by his all-pervading diffusive energies. The taste of water is the active principle of water. No one likes to drink seawater because the pure taste of water is mixed with salt. Attraction for water depends on the purity of the taste, and this pure taste is one of the energies of the Lord. The impersonalist perceives the presence of the Lord in water by its taste. And the personalist also glorifies the Lord for his kindly supplying tasty water to quench man's thirst. This is the way of perceiving the Supreme. Practically speaking, there is no conflict between personalism and impersonalism. One who knows God knows that the impersonal connect, uh, conception and personal conception are sim simultaneously present in everything and that there is no contradiction. Therefore, Lord Chaitanya established his sub sublime doctrine, Achintya Veda and Aveda Tattva, simultaneous oneness and difference. Hmm. Wow. So there's no, there's no difference. There's already saying there's no conflict between personalism and impersonalism. Any any thoughts on this verse in purport? One of the things I always, if I take a drink of water, I always think of Krishna. I think this verse has got us at least to that point. If I look at the moon, I think of Krishna, the sun, not as much. Krishna's own in the Vedic much, but here it says that he's perceived um, plenary by his different energies. What is it? Oh, the first sentence, by diverse material and spiritual energy. So Om is that spiritual energy, Vedic mantra, and then the ether and our ability, the taste of water. These are Krishna's separated material energies. And so, yeah, but I, uh, that's why I brought up the hearing. Anytime we're hearing, that's Krishna in the, in the, in the, he's the sound of ether. The ability in man, I, 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 I use that analogy a lot. If you see somebody that's able to do something, has some skill set that's extraordinary or even has a skill set at all, we can see that that's quite, um, that, that, that is Krishna. For me, that's a little easier. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into this ether, I think. That will be my assignment this week. Uh, finding Krishna within the sound vibration. It's okay when we're doing Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. That's a little, you know, we're supposed to be thinking of Krishna in the form of sound vibration. But just like when I'm talking to somebody, I'll be able to be uh, focused on Krishna by that sound vibration. Any reflection, any thoughts from our esteemed group? Any of our Hawaiian friends? You turned your microphone on, Jai, and that's why I said a Hawaiian friend. Oh, okay. I was like thinking there's people from Hawaii here. <laughs> <laughs> you got your Hawaii, 
I know I do have my Hawaiian background. I didn't catch the connection. I am so like in thought process of this. So I was thinking a couple of things from this verse and last verse that as Krishna is describing himself, like I am this, I am that, right? And the first few things he does is he ties it into our senses, like the taste and sound and um, the next one's fragrance, the other one's heat. Right. So it's like he's showing us that our senses are actually meant to serve him, mm. not ourselves. Right. So I was thinking of that. And then, of course, the taste of water. And I drink so much water and I'm a big proponent of, you know, we need to drink lots of water. And I was thinking about it's not just the taste of he doesn't just. And I think you said this before, it's not just the taste of water, but it's the quenching of the thirst is also Krishna. And that thirst isn't necessarily for water, that thirst could be for knowledge. It could for, you know, something higher and that Krishna is the absolute truth. So that is what we're at, you know, at the end of it, that's what we're seeking, right? So that's the truth of, that's the thirst that we have is for that truth. Um, that's that like underlying hankering that we have for anything that we want. It's really that we're hankering for Krishna, but we substitute it with our senses in so many different ways. And then when it comes to like absolute truth, such a like abstract concept, because, you know, you hear this term these days, oh, I'm, I'm just walking in my truth. I have to live my truth. You know, it's like a phrase that people say now. Um, I'm living in my truth, or I have to speak my truth. But you're, you know, I'm thinking, well, at the end of the day, there's just one absolute truth, mm. even though like we have our own individual truths, which aren't absolute, because I can be in the same place, in the same room, watching the same thing, and I'm experiencing something completely different than what somebody who's next to me is like, I mean, I was raised with you know, one sister and two brothers, and we're four completely different people, <laughs> <laughs> right? So it's not like we had a different environment in which we were raised. We're mm -hmm. all four completely different people though. So our truths growing up are different. So when we say absolute truth, it just starts to like, not my um, analytical mind where it's like, well, how is that? the absolute like how do you get down to that point of uncovering the absolute truth when everybody's truth is different and not everybody believes in a higher power or divine you know so they don't believe that that's their absolute truth but it is you just have yeah. to uh, making that connection i that just heard that property talking about that on the um on a lecture which is the day or yesterday Again, he's at the beach in Juhu, and somebody, one of the, the doctor could tell or something. He said, "What is the value? Of what we think? You know, who, who are you? Who are you? What is you know? We're like a little tiny. You know, if we were God, that's one thing. But what can we can't we can't create anything. You know, you can create. Probably said you can take some elements and you can build this skyscraper building, right? <laughs> I wish I knew what." whether he did that on purpose or not, a skyscraper. You know? And um, is, in other words, like you're saying, what is the value of our opinion or our, our truth? And there is an absolute truth, but we really, we want to avoid that absolute truth because when we, when, when, when we accept an absolute truth, then that means something that we have to uh, literally surrender to. And no one really wants to give up the independence. We don't want to give that up. That's why we're here. We wanted to, we wanted our independence. And it was really like the, the wrong term. We, we made, we went, we went into the wrong neighborhood. And um, dangerous, very dangerous. Going, that was just at the end of your thing. I was, there was like three or four things I cut when you were talking. Number one was, it's not, it's quenching of the thirst, but it's not just the water. It's the, that it, the, the water gives us the ability to taste things. Masohan, 
and the, and the taste, the taste of it. So that, that is not true in the Ayurveda and Ramatesha, that water provides taste, just like earth gives us a sense of smell. Water gives us a sense of taste. Right? Water gives us like the heat, et cetera. Ether gives us the ability to hear. Air gives us the ability to be able to touch and you know, not understand what's going on. All those things. And so it's not just the water, like you're saying, the quenching of the water, but it's the quenching of the, the, the taste. And we have, don't we have five tastes or six? Right. Five, five tastes, isn't it? And salty, sweet, pungent. Bitter, astringent. Yeah, astringent and pungent. Not yet pungent. It's, it's six actually. Yeah, that's why I said six. Sweet, salty, bitter, pungent, astringent, and sour. Yeah. And so it allows us to taste all those things. But the question I had, my Reggie Boomer's got her hand up, but the question I had for you, John, was now that you're a mature adult, and uh, are you are you seeing the differences between your siblings now more, or were you more alike when you were little? I, mean, I think the personality is always there, but what we thought and. Um, believed were similar when we were younger. And now like that trajectory is really straight far. I mean, like my sister's completely more on the impersonal side of things, but she does mm. believe in higher power. Um, yeah. You know, my brother, one of them just, he denies even believing even though he does a lot of the things. <laughs> and then the other, you know, he, He's kind of like, I know I can see it that he believes, but he also is more, I think, um, I want to say almost Mayavadi. You know? Agnostic? Not agnostic, but more like believes in all the demigods and. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so as you grew up, you all got your own point of view now before it's just kind of like, Covered, you know. Yeah. Yeah. But you're going. Is that your hand for a reason, or is that just? Yeah, I, I'm listening to Jai Sri Rahib. Thank you for that analogy because I was thinking about that when you she mentioned the analogy of not necessarily the water that we seek, but the the to quench something else, something much deeper, and. May I ask the stupid question? Because <laughs> well, it's something that's, that's been that's not... everybody agrees. It's, it's a foolish question. Well, it's something that's been gnawing at me for many years. Every time I read that Krishna is the taste of water, and I, I was just thinking when Shri, Jai Sri Rai has says that is something that we need, some uh, you know something that needs to be quenched, and tying it in with the particular taste of water. We don't like seawater for obvious reasons, but like personally now as an ad adult, I cannot drink any water unless it's Osarka. I even tried the type of water that you drank then and didn't like it. And then there's some water that if I, no matter how thirsty I am, like the sun, and if I take a taste, I spit it out, I can't stand it. So does that have to do with something that I'm serious? I am so spoiled. I used to drink Fiji water, lost the taste for it. For the past five years, I cannot taste anything. I don't like anything if it's not Osarka. So does that have yes. to do, I mean, is that a part? So here's the stupid question. Is that a particular taste of water? Is there a particular type of water out there that is so pure that, that that's Krishna's taste? Or is this because a specific different, you know, that we need that specific mode. thirst that we need to quench? Pure mode. It's my own. Mm. Mm. You you have a particular set of just like some people like eggplant, some people don't like it. Why the eggplants? Some people like eggplant, some people don't like eggplant. Some people like okra, some people don't like okra. Some people like smart water, some people don't like smart. 
Brahmacharya's wife was the same as you. I even, she would, they have like one of these very, very high tech water filters when they, when they remodeled their kitchen. And as soon as the first glass of water came out of it, she said, I'm not drinking. <laughs> and because of a particular flavor, you know, her, you know, what is, and then Tafer can give you an Ayurvedic medical, you know, reason for this, I'm guessing. I was going to say I'm sure, but I'm just guessing. But it, it's it's like the, it's like who was it? Like um, if some sometimes some people don't like like okra. If it's fried, I can handle it. But if it's boiled, forget it. It's too slimy. I don't like the sliminess. I just I, I mean, if I was starving, I'd eat it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't like. I'm just like you. If you're in the desert and it's something that's not your whatever kind of water you drink. I've never even heard of it. Unless you're, are you saying Dasini? Dasini? Osarka. Ozark? Ozark? Yeah. Ozark. Oh, Ozark. Yeah, I don't think they use it. Either. Texas brand. Hmm? It's a Texas brand. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Texas brand, yeah. I just met somebody the other day and all he drinks is Fiji water. He won't drink anything besides Fiji water. So I, my guess, my my understanding of that is just a personal, you know, karma on the taste buds that somebody has, just as much as someone would like one fruit over another, wouldn't like one fruit, wouldn't like another fruit, and so that's just that's just our taste buds telling us how to enjoy. And then you know, what is it? The only only foolish question is the one that's not asked because now people know that they like eggplant or don't like eggplant because eggplant or don't like eggplants just because they're taste of their motor material nature it's, it's our motor material nature that we like or dislike something it's just like music you know just like the other day this um Chevy Suburban. It's like as long as a city bus, you know. And the guy had speakers in there, like it was like a like a stadium concert or something. And literally, my whole I thought my car was going to move out of its parking spot. The whole road was vibrating, and it was so distasteful to me. But the guy was in there, like, and he was just like nodding his head. And, for me, it was just like, I, I was, I literally, I started my car and I was thinking, I'm going to leave. But then he got, he turned off his car and he went for a walk and I thought, okay, now I can stay. I was literally going to leave the place I was at. I was chanting Japa and I was getting, I was going to take a walk and leave. It was just so untasteful for me. But that's just my taste for music. I don't like that. You know, like literally, you think that the, the the screws or the rivets or whatever holds the car together are going to come out. You know, your car is just going to fall apart. So that's my motor nature. Everyone has their motor nature that they become attached to or or, 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 deep, or unattached or just do. This whole discussion, I think Jai's and Roger Bumi's discussion brought me up. Can you um can you click on three forty one and on page five? There's an interesting part of that. This this verse I learned many years ago. I'm not that's not from India, I'm not Yemenia, but it actually this is the one that uh Kamaesha is it's the answer to Kamaesha Proteasha Raja Bruns and Umba Bakaba. because uh, Arjun asked the question how it became a youth or why is one impelled to sinful activity as if being driven by a horse? And Krishna says, Kama Asia sluts own the origin, which is born of material mode of passion and later transformed into wrath. And so 341, Krishna tells Arjuna that the conclusion, because he tells Arjuna all the different aspects of this desire. Probably he actually translates Kama as desire and sometimes as lust. And so in 341, Chris, uh, Krishna tells Arjuna, in the very beginning, curb this great symbol of sin by regulating the senses 
and slay the destroyer of knowledge and self-realization. And then in the purport, Srila Prabhupada explains, the Lord advised Arjuna to regulate the senses from the very beginning so that he could curb the great sinful enemy of us, which destroys the urge for self-realization. This is that thirst for knowledge that Jai was talking about. In other words, each and every especially in the human form of life, um, the human form of life, there's an urge for understanding why we're here. And specifically, knowledge of the self destroys the urge, the, the destroyer of knowledge and, of, and self realization. So we want to know who we are, but these, this, this sense gratification disrupts that desire. Bogaish Ravon Prashakunam, that are priests of chastens, that those who are too attached to material offerings. And in material sense gratification, the rest of the determination to advance in spiritual life does not take place. So that's in the second chapter. So anyway, your 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 quench for knowledge, that quench for understanding made me think of this verse right. So very, very nice verse. Anyone else with takeaways? What do you call them? Reflections? How else we can finish the. Uh, we all just have one paragraph left. Okay, and then um, Maharaj, I just I would like to share um, that one of the devotees was telling me regarding this purport. He said, in the purport, Prabhupada says the test of water is the active principle of water. No one likes to drink sea water because the pure taste of water is mixed with salt. Attraction for water depends on the purity of the taste, and this pure taste is the is one of the energies of Lord. Mm -hmm. So, my friend was sharing with me. He said that, like, unless and until we try to relate energy around which is which we are surrounded with, unless and until we try to relate it with Lord, our Taste towards Lord would be tasteless. We won't, we, we won't be attracted towards Lord. Mm. And one of the way to do is to engage in trying to see how this particular energy or how this particular thing is related to Lord. Mm. And if we start to do that, then eventually we can take, just like in this purport, when Prabhupada says the pure taste of water. Mm. So he said, that's what we'll realize. And that's what we'll be attracted towards. The pure, the pure sound of the holy name. Yeah. <laughs> not this, not this. Yeah. The other thing that to yeah. Yeah. Was, yeah. We can, we can, we can match that up with almost every one of them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, nice. Anyone else? I have a volunteer to read the last paragraph. We have 15 minutes left. We have some good readers here. We have a lot of our students, high school students. Oh, I can read Maraj. Okay, that was a good key. <laughs> key for Saki, <laughs> she's in college. Thank you, Saki. Yeah. Um, the light of the sun in the is originally emanating from the Brahma Jyoti, which is the impersonal effulgence of the Lord. And pranav, or the omkar, transcendental sound in the beginning of every Vedic hymn, addresses the Supreme Lord. Because the impersonalists are very much afraid of addressing the Supreme Lord Krishna by his innumerable names, they prefer to vibrate the transcendental sound omkar. But they do not realize that omkar is the sound representation of Krishna. The jurisdiction of Krishna consciousness extends everywhere, and one who knows Krishna consciousness is blessed. Those who do not know Krishna are an illusion. And so knowledge of Krishna is liberation and ignorance of him is bondage. The jurisdiction of Krishna consciousness extends everywhere and one who knows Krishna consciousness is <clears throat> blessed. We're all blessed. Real good. Any thoughts on this? <clears throat> oh, I was thinking originally there is there's 
I think a quote that his one is Bhakti Tirtha Swami used to say, at least he used to tell my parents, that um, everybody is technically Krishna conscious, but some people just don't know it yet. Um, so that reminded me of this line, the jurisdiction of Krishna consciousness extends everywhere. No one who knows Krishna consciousness is blessed. Um, those who don't know are an illusion. So Krishna consciousness and Krishna is present everywhere. And like we said before, he's the string underneath the pearls. But the only difference is some people are aware of Krishna and some people choose to be ignorant of it, which I guess leads to bondage, as it, as it says in the last. That was one of our mantras when we were going on the Sankirtan in the 70s. Everyone's Krishna conscious, they just don't know we have a Gotta distribute the book, gotta get by hook or by crook. And just so that just so you know, the hook and the crook, the hook is meant to catch the fish, and the crook is not a thief, it's the shepherd's thing that it carries that brings the lamb back into the flock. It doesn't mean you um, does I mean you can say the devotees thought it meant <laughs> something different back in the day. Everything belongs to the Krishna. We're, 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 we're bringing Lakshmi back to Narayan. We're bringing Sita back to God. <clears throat> and we have many, many excuses for doing not so much civilized, maybe not as civilized as we could have been, but at least we started the movement. It was by hook and by bringing everybody back into the, into the um, realm of Krishna consciousness. Even the Christians say, don't they use the flock? They bring you, bring you back into the flock or something like that. Any thoughts on this? Any takeaways or reflections? Oh, we got a lot of, some, some weeks we get, it, we get it flowing and some weeks People are tired. I guess everyone's a little tired. I just wanted to add to the previous discussion that, you know, it's interesting that you said that the water opens up our taste for any taste. Like that's the foundation of any taste. And I think that that's interesting because water is the foundation of any food. Like we need water to grow the crops. Um, most fruits and vegetables are like 70, 90% water anyway. Um, you know, we need water to cook. We need water, like it's such an integral part of nourishing our body. Mm. I just, that was interesting. And then the second thing that I was thinking about in both verses is, and it goes to Prabhupada's point of like the personalism versus impersonalism is Krishna says, there's no truth superior than me. And I am, right? So I, me, mine, if you have I, there's, there's somebody that's saying I, that there's a, a person that's saying I, not just like mm -hmm. this fulgence that's saying I and me and mine, right? Like you, <laughs> there's gotta be a person that says that. Yes. The famous Krishna is like, you know, off your basin, off your homage to me. He's going like this. That's, that's, Puri John Prabhu does that in his Gita seminar. And he says the um, commentators on the Gita say Krishna is pointing to himself. I am, it's me. Offer your basin son to me, become my devotee. You know? And so that personal, like, you know, like you're pulling out the, the I, it's me, you know. Everything rests upon me, not just some impersonal because our Krishna is there talking to our Jim. It's not like, no, I don't want to say that. I was going to say not like a burning bush or something like that. But I, Christiane probably was saying that just today on a lecture, he was talking to that Professor Durkheim. Is that what his name was? Durkheim, that, German, that German professor, I think it's a philosophy professor or something. And probably said today, doesn't matter what name of God you chant. You see, if you if you know the name of God, you can chant that. If you don't know the name of God, take ours. <laughs> and, and the professor started cracking up. He said he thought that was like 
oh, that's a good idea. You know, you have a name of God. I don't have a name of God. Why don't I just use your name of God? That's a pretty good idea. He already really, you know, then probably used it two or three times because he knew he had a, he knew he had, you know, knock one out of the park. I don't know, probably I can't say that. Probably, you know, really, really uh, opened up the, his eyes opened up, you know, the eyes opened up and he said, yeah. Anyone else? We're, we're going for we're going for everyone to say a little something because we have eight minutes left and it's not enough time to do the whole verse. Who usually speaks up? Let's see. Uh, the Bangla. What happened to George? George. George. Okay. Please. I I, I have something to share again. Sure. Uh, God having a form, um, it reminds me of an experience I had when I was working at the morgue with uh, somebody from a different department, excuse me, and uh, he was a Muslim, and of course, from my understanding, Muslims don't believe God has a form, but as me and him were talking, he, he kept making references to seeing God, and he would say things like, when I see God in the face, I'm going to tell him face to face, so I kept pointing that out to him. I kept saying, if God doesn't have a form, how can he have a face for you to speak to? And that's that's just what I keep looking in my mind. He didn't want to say that. <laughs> that's quite interesting how George is saying, yeah, I was over the back. Of I was at the morgue one day. George is he's a pathologist or the morgue or whatever you call him. And you see, I thought you were going to say when he sees the patients face to face, you know, but um, yeah, you know, God has a face. I think almost all scriptures say something like that in, indirectly, right? You have that deep background. What in the, what in the biblical sense does the teacher say God has a face? I know he has a voice. He speaks in the he speaks in the in the ether. She doesn't have her microphone on. I mean, she doesn't have her microphone on. Um, thanks so much. No, okay. Maybe she's just stepped aside. She she used to be a Jehovah's Witness and go door to door, but she knows inside and out. And um, in hard issue. Okay, if there's nothing else, what do you think, Anantheshwar? Go ahead. I would like to share something from the purport. This okay. part. Um, so one of my devotee friend who was a hardcore Mayavadi before he came to this movement. So I, when like we were reading this, I asked him, you know, why is it so that the Mayavadis, they like the impersonalists, they like to chant Omkara rather than any you know, form of Lord, uh, other name of Lord. So yeah. it's very simple. He said, You take any name of Krishna, it is related with some of his form or some of his activity. And along with that, the form comes in front of you. He gave me an example. He said, You think about Keshava, like you. I remember the Krishna's beautiful hair. You talk about mm -hmm. Damodara. He said there is no name of Krishna which is like impersonal. Everything mm -hmm. has a form. Mm -hmm. Except Omkar. Because you cannot imagine yeah. Krishna standing like that. So they prefer to call Krishna you know, as Omkar. But the Hare, the Omkar is contained within Hare Krishna. Probably explains yeah. that. I think that's the 10th chapter. Yeah. One card is contained within Hare Krishna. Well, we had a nice gathering. <laughs> Everyone seems to be content with uh, just reading the purpose, verse and purpose tonight. Amanteshwar, we have four minutes. What do we do? Let the kid out his class early tonight, or? 
Yeah, my uh, she says the system was mic is not working. She wrote uh, she always knew that we were born in the image of Krishna mm. and created in his likeness. Likeness we learned that as kids and yet they say he has no form. When she, when she started to question. Uh, uh like she told them that if we have come if we have come krishna should also have form and mm. it seemed that they didn't have the answer for that mm. because in the biblical aspect um more impersonal form of lord is been presented yeah yeah this yeah. one okay thank you Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. I hope it was. I hope, hope it was enlightening, and I hope it was okay. We didn't get as even that Nanteshwar and I the last couple of weeks been saying, "Boy, we're really getting the people to start opening up." Today was a little bit slower, but still, we got a lot.